Hey everybody, this is Zachary Jeans, and let's keep walking through the Bible. So today is day 88, and we are in Luke chapter 18, verse 31, and we're going to cross over into chapter 19 to verse 27. But before we get going, let's ask God for help. Lord, <laughs> I don't deserve your mercy, um, but you're really good to give it you're the lord of heaven and earth and i am not we just ask that you would open up um, our eyes and our ears and our hearts to who you are and what this is all about help us see clearly and lord we just ask that that our joy would be totally full in knowing you, Lord. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right. Verse 31 of chapter 18. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets, will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them and they did not grasp what was said. Jesus is telling them straight to their face. In Luke's gospel, this is the third account. We don't know exactly how many times he told them, but clearly more than a couple. In Luke's case, three times. Um, but to the point that his closest followers he told them straight to their face, this is what is going to happen to me. And they'd kind of hear it, and then it just wouldn't resonate in their brain. It just didn't make sense. They're like, I don't get it. And there's so much going on, and then they just let it go by. There's so many things that are clearly like right here in our face. And uh, we can't process it. It could be too traumatic, too cringy. We don't want to see it. It's like, ah. Um, but in, these, in the case of these disciples, they have the full revelation of who Jesus is to them and what he's about to go through. And they just won't, it just won't process for them. But thank God that he did say these things. It's when God puts something in our path and he tries to tell us something. And it sticks just enough so that when something does happen, God will remind us of the, that time when he showed us something. And it builds a bridge. And it, it helps our... It's a gift to us. To, it establishes a bridge to the past, to the present, and gives us um, an understanding that God is bigger than our moment-by-moment -moment situations. It, it, like, establishes faith. So, he did this for his cross, but he'll do this in little ways in our lives, and I'm sure you've experienced them. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. So the blind man cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But the blind man cried out all the more. 
Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. It's kind of side points, but I have like two side points for this. <clears throat> Shame and no shame. So people were like walking with Jesus and, you know, they hear people crying out to Jesus all the time. <clears throat> and Jesus walked past a ton of people who he didn't heal. And he walked past people that were poor and he didn't give them anything, any money or food. or He, he did a lot, but he, he wasn't like, he walked past all kinds of folks. And so there are people that are sort of going along with him going, well, this is like too awkward. We aren't going to uh, tell the teacher to stop and take care of this dude. So we're going to tell him, hey, look, he's busy. He's going to Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, pipe down. It's not your turn. But the guy doesn't care. He sees his one shot. He's probably heard stories about him. And uh, he takes his one shot. And he leans into it with everything he's got. He doesn't care what people think about him. Doesn't care what is the decorum of his friend group. Or his professional group thinks. Because he realizes he's no fool. He understands he's blind. He understands he's in a desperate situation. And he doesn't care. He doesn't care what these cool kids that are walking with Jesus think. He just wants to be fixed and saved. He just wants to be whole. And he cries out and he doesn't care. So if you realize your situation and your desperate situation and we're all desperate it's just our blindness to our desperation situation but if you realize it don't care what other people think about you calling out to jesus for help care more about jesus than you do about them and he'll sort it out for you. And the second thing is, he says, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. This is the handshake. Jesus didn't do this without this blind man's faith. There's a handshake between us and God. He created these moments, these bridges of connectivity of us believing that he can, and him having the power that he does. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was a small small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. 
And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, and he had he had uh, done quite well for himself. But something was itching at him, pretty hardcore, and he wanted to meet this this Jesus to see who he really was. And it didn't matter that he was a tax collector and he had, you know, skimmed a whole bunch off the top of a lot of people. Jesus was willing to forgive him. It didn't matter that he was in a position of leadership and knew what he was doing. And he's not just, you know, a poor person put upon by the government. Uh, you know, the Roman soldiers and whatnot. He, he's a person in a position of authority. And, it's, and, and even though Jesus has said it's really hard for a rich person to come to the Lord, um, it's harder than a camel going through an eye of a needle. Zacchaeus shows us that there is the opportunity, that there is the possibility that all the riches in this world and all the authority and social status that a person has can be overcome. And whether he's the, there's the blind beggar who doesn't care what, you know, all the, the cool kids with Jesus are telling him to shut up. Hey, teacher's passing by. We're, we're going somewhere. Don't have time to stop for you. Or Zacchaeus, who's got all the, uh, all the connections as, as it were in society. And he's having a hard time seeing the teacher, but the teacher is willing to stop for him and give him the same opportunity. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas, and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him, and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over, there, over us. So when he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants, to whom he had given the money, to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, you are to be over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you didn't sow. He said to him, I will condemn you. <clears throat> Let me back up. I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to... I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for the enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Hmm. 
Hmm. Jesus tells a story of a guy sent to go claim his kingdom and then puts people in charge of some of his wealth in the meantime. And they have varying degrees of success with that wealth. And one person in particular doesn't do much with it at all, which says, hey, I'm not going to lose it for you. And he comes back and he starts to account with his servants. And the one that took 10 and made 10, great. Put him in charge of a whole bunch. And eventually even the, the, the investment that the one person just held on to, it was taken away from him. There's no reward. And he's rebuked. And those who were going to reject him, not his servants, but like the the people that he was sent to rule over, the ones that weren't there to receive him, he slaughters. And they're slaughtered in front of him. And this is all in context of them asking about him going into Jerusalem and, you know, is his kingdom going to come? He goes, let me tell you a story about that kingdom. This is what it's going to be like. So we are the servants and we've been entrusted with a whole bunch. Some of us gifts and abilities and opportunity worth 10, some with five and some with one. And Jesus will hold us accountable. He is giving us this opportunity to use our gifts for his glory. And there is reward and it's a good thing. And people often say, well, I'm not going to do this because they get in this whole humble track where Jesus on the one hand is telling us to come with, you know, just not seeking, you know, any glory for ourselves and whatnot. But then they let that leech over into passages like this that says that he wants to reward those who are faithful, that there are rewards that we don't even understand in the next life for doing what he asked us to do with the right heart. So, but for those of us who take our faith and are refused to do anything with it, I don't know that he's saying, he's not saying that that faith is literally worth less, but there is no rewards. If you don't do anything with your faith, there's no rewards. And somebody would be like, well, you know, Lord, I knew you were kind of harsh and, you know, I didn't want to lose what you gave me and, you know, didn't want to rock the boat. And he's like, you didn't get it. That's not why I gave this faith to you. That's not why I gave you gifts and abilities. The other part here, which is plainly obvious, is that for those that reject him, there is going to be judgment. And there is going to be a ruthless account. He uses the word in this story, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Wow. Jesus came as a lamb and was being led in this time frame to the slaughter. But he's coming back as a lion. And he is going to absolutely tear apart his enemies. And it's not an... It is going to be more than cringy. It's going to be raw and horrific and shocking for those who think that Jesus is A 1976 hippie in San Francisco coming to Jesus. It's 
That's not Jesus. That's only one little glint of who Jesus is. It's true. There's some 1975 hippie guy that represents a component of who Jesus is. His love and his uh, just joy and worship and simplicity of life. And there are contexts and aspects that that represents. But he is also just a horrific sword wielding warrior king that's willing to be in the very front line and that Jesus it's almost a little John Wick <laughs> you know like so anyway that last line, man. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here. Slaughter them before me. I want to watch. Wow. When he comes back. Wow. Anyway. Give God the... Give God. If you're having issues with stuff down here, during this time frame, we're in the time of the Lamb. Our little lives, be faithful with the things God gives you. Do as much as you can for his glory and his good. And any issues you have down here with conflict and whatnot, you give to God for this day. And when he comes back, he'll take care of it. Don't take things into your own hands. Put them into God's hands. Anyway. Till tomorrow, day 89. God bless. Keep walking. Bye-bye.